minutes away. Hours of fun. See another world. Stearnsport. Your local affordable source for family fun. Shouldn't that go into recycling? 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 Everybody knows the trash gets sorted. We don't need no stinking recycling. The fact is, no trash gets sorted, friend. So if it goes in there, it just ends up at a landfill. There's only one way to settle this. <laughs> Draw. Barber recycled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I pledge. Pledge to take I the pledge. 20 gallon challenge. It's easy I and simple. Pledge. Turn your sprinklers on and check for leaks once a month. I pledge. Use three inches of mulch throughout your garden. I pledge. Use online tools to adjust your watering schedule. I pledge. Install a rain sensor and it will automatically shut off your sprinklers when it is raining. I pledge. Save water now. Take the 20 gallon challenge at svwater.org. 10,000 years ago, early cave dwellers relied on natural fiber shoulder pouches to gather their food. Native Americans used baskets made of rushes or reeds to collect and carry acorns, berries, or fish. In the mid-19th century, gold miners loaded their saddlebags with precious metals and packed it onto their donkeys. Even 1930s American movie icons skipped down the yellow brick road with full baskets for the journey. In the 70s, we were all grooving to the latest funkadelic sounds with our out-of-sight bags. History shows us that reusable is a better way to go. So this holiday season, use reusable bags for all your shopping. Where's your bag? Hi, I'm Rachel Sennis with City TV, coming up next on Inside Santa Barbara. How you doing tonight? Driving under the influence, what getting a DUI really means. And as city employees prepare to take an unpaid work furlough, we take a look at how this will affect city services. And winter vacation is upon us. Do your children have something to do? We'll show you some fun programs that will keep your kids healthy and active. All that and much more on City TV's award-winning news magazine show, Inside Santa Barbara. And welcome to Inside Santa Barbara, the city's only news magazine show. We bring you up to date on the city's most significant issues, projects, and events. Well, we've all heard a lot lately about city employee furloughs. But what are furloughs and how will they affect city services over the holidays? In our top story, City TV's Chris Bell has all the answers. This past June, city non-public safety employees voluntarily agreed to a 5% pay cut in the form of a 104-hour work furlough. The furlough means these employees are required to take 13 days of unpaid leave from work this fiscal year. This move saved the city millions of dollars. What we've been able to achieve is uh, $1.7 million in labor savings to the general fund and another $1.3 million to other funds. Um, if we hadn't 
been able to get the furlough and vacation cash out concessions, we would have had to cut much deeper into the organization that we needed to. City management scheduled the furlough days so as to minimize impact on the public. We'll be closing during the Christmas and New Year's uh, periods when our contact with the public is historically lower. And then four Fridays uh, scattered throughout the year. Most city facilities like City Hall and the Public Works Community Development Building will be closed from Monday, December 21st through Friday, January 1st. Some departments, though, like Public Works and Parks and Recreation, have altered their furlough schedules to perform certain services over the holidays. We will have a number of activities that continue because obviously water, sewer, um, some of the construction activities will continue to be taking place um, during the furlough period and the staff in those areas will just be balancing their hours in uh, a different way so that those 24-hour operations will continue. During the furlough period, a number of our recreation facilities will be open largely for regular business. The Santa Barbara Golf Club will be open with the exception of Christmas Day. The Cabrillo Pavilion will be open where we'll be able to take facility reservations. Los Banos Pool will be open for its regular business hours with the exception of holidays such as Christmas and New Year's. And the West Side Center will also be open for business. Other facilities that won't be open include our administration offices, the Franklin Center, the Davis Center, and the Teen Center. However, people who are interested in reserving those facilities in the new year will be able to do so at the West Side Center. All of our parks will be open. We will have a small crew of park staff who will be opening and cleaning restrooms, taking care of litter, and any other needs that we have in the community or in our parks, such as inspecting our playgrounds. We will have a couple of forestry staff um, available in the event that there are tree needs that need to be attended to during the furlough period. City libraries have also adjusted their furlough schedules. December is traditionally the least busiest time of year for libraries, but as we've learned with the past few furloughs that people really miss their libraries on closed days so we do plan to have each of our system libraries open a few days during the furlough period we do um, will have the hours posted on our website and each of the branches will be distributing a bookmark that lets people know the open days for their particular branch due dates for checked out materials will be adjusted around furlough closures but if your book or DVD is already overdue, fines will accrue during those days. Renewals and a number of other services are available online, though. You can request items. You can monitor uh, your account to, to see when things are due. You can access our online databases. Um, you can download audiobooks and listen to them if you can't get access to books in the library. So there are quite a few things that you can do despite the fact that the libraries will be closed. For issues with water or sewer mains, water meters, graffiti, streets, sidewalks, traffic signals, street lights and signs, street sweeping, storm drains, or damaged trees, you can call the repair hotline at 564-5413. If you like to pay your water, sewer, and trash bill in person, you'll have options during the furlough, even though City Hall will be closed. During that two-week period that we're, we're going to be closed, we will have limited staff here working um, a skeleton crew who will be processing payments that are received through the mail. We also have um, staff here will be processing payments that are received through our lockbox. We have a lockbox at the front of the City Hall building where folks can, you know, in an envelope, put their checks for their utility payments and we'll be processing those during that two-week period, essentially to make sure that uh, people's accounts are credited on a timely basis. We don't have any late penalties assessed or, or any of fees, so those things will be processed timely during that period while we're closed. And if you want to pay a parking citation, you can still do so at the police department, mail it, or you can now pay online. We have a, a, a program online on our website, the Santa Barbara CA .gov, where they can uh, make their payments using a credit card. Um, they'll have to know their parking citation number or the driver's license number, but uh, they can do it in that way. And we'll also, of course, anything coming through the mail for parking citations will process during that two-week period as well. 
Remember, police and fire services will not be affected by the work furlough. And for a detailed list of office closures, visit the city's website. That's SantaBarbaraCA.gov. Well, if you've been following the news lately, then you know that there have been a rash of drunk driving accidents in the city. Well, in our next story, I joined the Santa Barbara Police Department as they try to take people driving under the influence off the streets. And I learned just how costly of a mistake a DUI could be. Captured on tape, a high-speed pursuit of a drunk driver. The Santa Barbara Police Department pursues the car through the streets of downtown Santa Barbara until the driver encounters a dead end. This is the exact location on Chapala Street where that accident happened seven years ago. In this case, the drunk driver did not realize that this was a dead end street until it was too late. The results of drunk driving can vary. It could end up being a little fender bender or a major accident like the one you just saw. But in order to prevent any of those scenarios, the Santa Barbara Police Department tries to take drunk drivers off the streets before they can do any harm. So don't be surprised if you come across one of these. How you doing tonight? Hi. I'm Officer Hans with the Santa Barbara Police Department. We are checking to make sure that people have a valid driver, driver's license and that they are not drinking and driving. Any, any alcohol tonight? These okay, are sobriety checkpoints. They are conducted about three to four times a month at different locations, courtesy of a grant from the State Office of Traffic Safety. The grant pays for officers to work this on an overtime basis, so all the officers, officers that are working are on overtime, and some are detectives, some are patrol officers, and, and uh, we still have the rest of the, the city to police, so the, so the officers that are on the beat stay on the beat. Although the SBPD alerts people when DUI checkpoints will be taking place, they don't reveal where. And if you think you can avoid these checkpoints, the SBPD says, think again. We rove. We don't just stay in one place and during the night. We'll, we'll pick this checkpoint up and we'll take it to another location. And, uh, you know, just being out here, I think, I think it has a uh, positive influence on people knowing that we are out here and thinking twice about drinking and driving. Officers with the Santa Barbara Police Department usually follow a specific pattern to stop certain cars. For example, they'll stop every third or fourth vehicle. But in this case, it is Friday night here on State and Pedregosa Streets, and officers are stopping every single driver to investigate drunk driving. Any alcohol tonight? No. We'll just ask people to see their driver's license and talk to them and make sure that they haven't been drinking. If they don't have their driver's license, then we'll pull them over and, and investigate that. And uh, if they show signs of uh, intoxication or that they've been drinking that night, then we ask them to pull over and, and we'll run them through a series of field sobriety tests. Those include testing their attention and motor skills. Drivers can be asked to do a one-legged stance or walk a straight line. If officers have reasonable suspicion you've been drinking, they will ask you to take a breath test which requires blowing into this machine to read your BAC, or blood alcohol content. If you blow over the legal limit of .08 BAC, then you are considered under the influence and will be cited. If you refuse to take the breath test, then you will be arrested and taken to the county jail, where a nurse will draw your blood to check your blood alcohol level. And contrary to popular belief, there are a few scenarios where officers do have the right to give you a breath test even without probable cause. If you're under 21, you're dri by signing your driver's license, it says you will submit to a pass test uh, if officer stops you um, and uh, to check and see if you have any alcohol in your blood. And then also people that are on probation, they are required to agree to give a breath sample to an officer if they're stopped to see if there's any alcohol in their system. Ask anyone who has received a DUI. That first offense is no walk in the park. Better yet, ask Senior Deputy District Attorney Lee Carter with the Santa Barbara County District Attorney's Office. He has prosecuted thousands of DUI cases over the past 22 years. It's very expensive. I've sat down and tried to calculate the cost. By the time somebody pays for an attorney, pays their fines, pays uh, to get their car out of impound, pays uh, the increase in insurance, which is, I think, three years. 
All total, it costs over $10,000. Added to that $10,000 mistake, you will have a misdemeanor conviction on your record. You'll lose your license usually up to 120 days, and you'll be on probation for three years. And if you are found to have any alcohol in your system during those three years, you will be in violation of your probation, and you could go to jail. Typically, if you are found to be driving under the influence, SBPD will issue a DUI citation and find a responsible adult to take you home, while your car is impounded to make sure that you don't drive again for the night. But if a responsible adult is not available, officers will take you here, where you'll fill out simple forms and receive a blanket to sleep it off. After the required minimum of four hours, then you are free to go. You're here for a reason. And we treat everyone the same. It doesn't matter if you're a, a millionaire or a pauper. We get school teachers, lawyers, businessmen, uh, government people, homeless students, you name it, we get them. Men, women, boys, girls. We don't take anybody under 18, they go straight to ju juvenile hall. There's no locks on the door, there's no bars on the windows. If you want to leave, you can leave. But if you do, a, you can never come back, and B, we call dispatch. If you're picked up on the street, you go straight to jail. Cost-wise, it's a lot more economical. It also keeps the uh, police officers, they bring somebody in here and leave them with us. They're here five minutes. They take them to jail to the drug tank. They're there an hour and a half. Keeps the cops on the road where they belong, doing their job. But the sobering center is only for first-time offenders. A second-time offender won't be able to just sleep it off here. Instead, they'll be napping in here. A second-time offense is no longer a bad mistake. A second-time offense is somebody who's either got a serious problem with alcohol or they're just a danger to society. So in that case, the stakes are upped a lot. Uh, where I told you the police department would issue a citation to a first-time offender, not to a second-time offender. They are such a hazard, they're going to go to jail. The uh, penalty for a second-time offense is up to one year in the county jail, and that's if they don't hurt anybody. If they hurt anybody, it becomes a felony. Third-time offenders can expect a lot of jail time. In addition, it will be a long time before they can drive again. The absolute minimum amount of time they can spend in custody is 120 days that's required by law. They cannot do less than 120. Uh, their, their license is going to be suspended for three years. They're going to be on probation for probably five years. And again, they could do a year in the county jail. Uh, fines are pretty much the same, but by now, they're, they're not going to have a driver's license. So you know, whether or not they get insurance is kind of a moot point because they're, they can't drive. And so then if they go out and drive, that's going to be a violation of their probation. They're going to go to jail. It's a very serious matter then. All this for driving under the influence, assuming there are no injuries. The consequences of causing an injury accident while driving under the influence are far greater. That typically is a felony. Now, because it's a felony, that means they could serve up to three years in state prison. And if they seriously injure somebody or kill somebody, it goes up higher from there. And it's not just difficult for the drunk driver, but for the victims and their families. We can't give them back what they had. Uh, as a DA, I can never give them back what they had before they were involved in that accident. That was probably somebody else's fault. Sometimes they were just a passenger in the car. Sometimes they're in another car that's hit by the drunk driver. It's absolutely devastating to them. Uh, and, and again, I would love to give the, put them back where they were before the accident. All I can do is punish the wrongdoer. I can never make the injured party whole, and, and that's tr it's tragic. It's easy to say, don't drink and drive. Most likely you've heard it many times before, but what do you do about it? There are simple solutions. For example, assign a designated driver, be the designated driver, walk, take public transportation, or catch a taxi. A few bucks is a small price to pay compared to the possible alternatives. During the DUI checkpoint held on Friday, November 13th, the Santa Barbara Police Department cited six people for driving under the influence. And the SBPD says if you suspect somebody of driving under the influence, you should call 911. And we'll be right back.
Rediscover your sense of Santa Barbara. Stern's Wharf. You're on to something. If your business is paying too much for trash, the City of Santa Barbara's Environmental Services team can assist you to recycle more. To recycle more, call Environmental Services, 564-5587. I pledge. Pledge to take I the 20-gallon challenge. It's easy I and simple. Pledge. Turn off the tap while doing dishes. We pledge. Fixing leaky toilets saves thousands of gallons of water. We, we pledge. pledge. Always run full loads of laundry. Use a high-efficiency clothes washer which saves water and energy. We pledge. Save water now. Take the 20-gallon challenge at svwater.org. 10,000 years ago, early cave dwellers relied on natural fiber shoulder pouches to gather their food. Native Americans used baskets made of rushes or reeds to collect and carry acorns, berries, or fish. In the mid-19th century, gold miners loaded their saddlebags with precious metals and packed it onto their donkeys. Even 1930s American movie icons skipped down the yellow brick road with full baskets for the journey. In the 70s, we were all grooving to the latest funkadelic sounds with our out-of-sight bags. History shows us that reusable is a better way to go. So this holiday season, use reusable bags for all your shopping. Where's your bag? Another day in your day-to-day -day replay. Moments you might cherish pass you by But the light of the morning seems to say That one small thing can change the world The morning light remains The smile that you offer is returned Portion of the day can be blamed on the fact that one small thing can change the world. Inside Santa Barbara on City TV Channel 18. While recycling has been available to businesses for years, but many either don't recycle or recycle very little of what is possible. Well, up next, City TV's Becky Oxborough shows us how the city is making recycling easier and helping businesses save money on their trash bills. Each year, 90,000 tons of waste is dumped into our local landfill, a third of that waste coming from the city's business sector alone. Although some businesses have adopted ways of recycling and composting, still 41% of business waste that can be recycled or composted ends up in trash bins. In an effort to drastically decrease Santa Barbara's waste production, the city has recently approved change to the business solid waste rates. The old rate structure for the business sector included uh, a discount of about 50% for recycling services or green waste services. That being 50% less than the cost of trash. 
So if $100 a month is what you're spending on trash, you could have the same size container every month and you'd be spending $50 a month. It was a pretty good discount if you wanted to divert material out of the trash bin. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't doing enough, it wasn't providing enough incentive because the diversion rate for the business sector as of this past summer was only 14%. The new rates were approved by council on October 27th and immediately went into effect beginning November 1st. Since then, 23 businesses have become active in the food scraps program and are being serviced by Allied Waste or Marborg. So the food scrap program is a new program that just started this November 1st and it's been a, we've been in pilot stages for over two years and it's a program to uh, collect and divert from the landfill and compost all of the organic material including you know the typical fruit and vegetable scraps but a lot of other things that people don't typically think of as compostable like meat and bones and, um, and compostable containers and things. Um, quite, a, quite a huge percentage of the waste stream is compostable material. The city expects 10 more businesses to participate by the end of the month and up to 80 or 90 businesses by the end of the fiscal year. This steady increase of business participants should result in an estimate of 14 percent waste diversion which means a drop in nearly 5,000 tons of waste. So there's significant opportunity for all businesses to save money with the new rate structure um, by implementing diversion programs such as recycling and composting. Um, if a business doesn't have any diversion and they have a you know average amount of waste, then they can save at least a hundred or two hundred bucks on their waste bill by by recycling and composting. Uh, some businesses might just want to implement basic recycling and composting programs, or just recycling and try and neutralize the increase in trash. Although rates similar to these have been around since the launch of the pilot program in April of 2007, it still wasn't enough to get the majority of business participation. With the new rate structure, but it's very basic. All I knew is that my rates were going up um, as of the new year, roughly, um, as a result of, I think it was just pretty much across the board in the Santa Barbara area. So as an incentive to implement the, the composting program, it would offset the additional charges. It wouldn't save you money, but it would save it from going up. So it was an incentive to, to uh, put it in place. The way we design the new rate structure is every business has an opportunity to save money. Every business. Unless they're already diverting 90% of all their materials, like the Sojourner Cafe. They're at 90% diversion or so. There's really nowhere for them to go. You know, They're diverting as much as they, as they possibly can. So in that case, that business isn't going to be able to do more. But that said, they're paying less than they were November 1st or October 31st. The rates, when someone's diverting that much, were a, it was a huge incentive for them to stay at that level. But if every business would see a significant decrease in their waste bill, why wouldn't someone make the switch? One of the main reasons businesses are not diverting green waste is due to a lack of space for receptacles. Oftentimes we have a situation where multiple businesses are sharing a single enclosure and it's, it becomes important to uh, establish a bin sharing agreement, as we call it, where the businesses come together and make an agreement about how much each and every one of them is going to pay based on their, their volume of waste. A lot of times they already have that agreement. And then we come in and help them all save money by increasing recycling and by implementing composting. The change to the new business rates not only help businesses lower their costs, but they also make paying those bills much easier thanks to the new and improved utility bill layout. This new layout can be viewed by going to the city's website at www.sbrecycles.org. This new rate structure I think is one of the most visionary and forward-thinking structures or rate structures of any jurisdiction in the country. You know, we worked with our professional consultant, this PhD out of Colorado for, for a year approximately and we had her and her staff researching all the other rate structures in the jurisdictions throughout the country. Um, we found some cities that were offering recycling for free, but we, there were a lot of policy decisions for, that went behind us deciding not to go, policy implications for not going with free recycling. People would abuse that sort of thing. Um, but I believe an 85% discount for recycling or food scraps or green waste is one of the best, most progressive rate structures of any jurisdiction in the country. 
And so we're just excited to see this play out. We really are looking forward to some major success in diverting from the landfill from the businesses. As a result of these new rates, the city expects hundreds of businesses to begin diverting green waste this fiscal year alone. And while the city hopes to reach a goal of 66% diversion from the business sector, the future looks bright for reaching an even higher goal of 85% diversion by the year 2020. For more information on how you can divert your business food scraps, call one of the city's commercial recycling and composting specialists. That number is 564-5631. Well, the next time you shop at certain grocery stores using your reusable bags, there's a chance you may come home with more than just milk and eggs. We explain in our next story. Hi, how are you? Hi, good, how are I'm you? I'm Dean, I'm the store manager for Albertsons. Hi. And you're our first prize winner of our Where's Your Bag Prize Patrol. Really? Yeah, you brought your recycle bag in. Oh my God, awesome. Isn't that awesome? So <laughs> Today we gave out a $75 Albertsons gift card. Yeah, along with some little goodies and t-shirts along with that. It's just really exciting to get the message out there and to make uh, people feel good about what they're doing every day. It's designed to educate people about the reasons why we want people to use fewer bags and to help them remember them. We have decals for their car windows, we have parking lot signs going up at stores, signage in stores, because the people that we talk to really want to bring their bags, but forget. So we designed this campaign to, to be of service in that way. Plastic has a very um, negative impact on the marine environment with marine animals um, and seabirds ingesting plastic and, and dying oftentimes. So it's you know really in line with our mission to help reduce the use of plastic bags. And on the flip side, we don't want to be encouraging paper bags because they also have um, detrimental environmental impacts. I keep it in the same place all the time. So I always know when I stop at the grocery store, I pop my trunk and there it is. It was the most exciting point of my day today, actually. Yes, I haven't won anything in a really long time, so it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and to find out which local grocery stores are participating in the Where's Your Bag campaign, visit wheresyourbag.com. Well, in our next story, we take you underneath city streets to a complex system hundreds of miles long, a system that serves a significant purpose to both people and the environment on a daily basis. They are sewer laterals, and City TV's Becky Oxborough digs deep into the city's sewer lines. You can see a defect there. There's a separation in the clay pipe, and you can see soil visible on the bottom at the flow line. A the complex city. network of streets and highways run throughout the city of Santa Barbara, but there also lies a system of equally important pipes and lines underground that we often forget about until there's a problem. Inspection is required when the city has determined that a private sewer lateral may be defective due to root intrusion, uh, partial blockage, obstruction, or defects on the mainline connection, or as a result of part of the city's inspection programs identifying smoke defects from the private sewer lateral or water infiltration due to illegally connected drains, patio drains, and roof and downspouts. Those are primarily identified during the city's smoke test program. This system of pipes is called sewer laterals, and there are nearly 300 miles of them below the surface of Santa Barbara. Sewer lateral is this portion of sewer pipe that extends from the house foundation out to the public sewer system, including the main line connection. It's referred to, commonly referred to as the upper lateral, which is the portion on the private property, and the lower lateral, which is the portion of the public right-of-way. Property owners responsible for the entire lateral, including the main line connection on the public sewer main. Since public and private laterals are connected together in the sewer system, problems on private property can cause problems for the public system, making it necessary for the city to conduct sewer lateral inspections. During these inspections, wastewater crews take a closed-circuit television camera, often referred to as CCTV, to locate problems within the system. The predominantly main problem that the city finds in the, sewer, in the public sewer system is roots from private sewer laterals protruding into the public sewer main. Roots seek out the nutrient-rich environment of the public sewer main as well as the private sewer laterals. They seek out the warm environment and, at and atmosphere and vapors from the sewer system. Eventually, those roots will grow into a root mass, which causes a blockage of the private sewer lateral, 
where the property owner would need to call out a plumber, thus they would be experiencing slow drainage and possibly an overflowing private cleanout. But how do tree roots infiltrate the sewer system in the first place? Well, it's in certain areas where we have a lot of older pipe and um, typically older pipe, older trees, you, you tend to get root intrusion. This is an example of what's referred to as Orangeburg pipe. It's a cardboard tar impregnated pipe that's predominantly used for sewer systems, private sewer laterals in the 40, 1940s through 1950s. There's a lot of residential properties in the city of Santa Barbara that have this type of pipe. As you can see, it fails, becomes deformed. Right here you have an example of root intrusion, which subsequently causes blockage from the private sewer lateral, as well as protruding into the public sewer main. When an inspection finds a problem in the lateral on private property, various measures are taken to fix it. If you receive a letter from the City of Santa Barbara directing you to inspect your private sewer ladder, you will also receive a certified qualified plumbing inspectors list. We have approximately 65 local plumbers that are on the certified list identifying that they've attended the mandatory training. Your certified plumber will be responsible for identifying if your property has any rain downspouts or illegal storm drain connections or yard or patio drains. Thanks to the Sewer Lateral Inspection Program, launched in January of 2007, the city, in cooperation with private property owners, has successfully seen the replacement of over 1,500 private sewer laterals throughout the city. In fact, the Sewer Lateral Inspection Program, also referred to as SLIP, has far exceeded the city's original expectations of replacing approximately 200 sewer laterals and instead replace nearly 600 in its first year alone. The city has an incentive program as an element to the private sewer lateral inspection program. The incentive program is an, offers an incentive rebate of up to $150 for the inspection of a private sewer ladder, assuming that the ladder is in good repair. The property owner is required to contact a certified plumber from a list that the city provides to the property owners. That certified plumber would be responsible for providing a videotape of that private sewer lateral. The city will make a determination after review and assessment of that videotape in regards to the condition of that private sewer lateral, whether the property owner is entitled to the $150 rebate or not. Since tree root intrusion is the number one cause of stoppages leading to sewer overflows, it is vital for the city to have an aggressive preventative maintenance program. As part of this program, the wastewater section has three main cleaning vehicles, with their newest addition being the Hydrovactor. We've got a brand new truck here. This truck is very sophisticated piece of machinery. It has a vacuum system. It has uh, a very strong pump. It has all the, the things that we need in our in our capabilities to mitigate any problems that we have with the sewer system. The city's wastewater collection section was recently recognized in a feature article of Municipal Sewer and Water, a national publication. To view this article, visit the website at www.mswmag.com. For more information, call the city's wastewater office. That number is 568-1010. Well, if you have kids and you're looking for something constructive for them to do over vacation, you'll want to watch our next story. In it, City TV's Nina Sang shows us four programs that are sure to keep your children healthy and active. As 2009 comes to a close, youth all around town are looking forward to the start of one very important event, winter break. But for parents who have to work or need time to brave crowded shopping malls, Finding a safe place for their kids while they're out of school can be stressful. Understanding that challenge, the Parks and Recreation Department is offering four fun and affordable activities over the winter break. Our goal is to keep children healthy and active, and during the holidays, that's oftentimes, you know, something hard to do for families. If your child's vocabulary includes terms like kickflips, indies, or ollies, he or she would probably be interested in the skate clinic. The skate clinic started, believe it or not, 12 years ago, actually two years before the skate park was even built. 
The idea took off after Parks and Rec received requests from the community to offer a program since so many kids were hanging out with nothing to do. Now it has grown to be one of the most popular programs. Kids are split up according to their skill level. They learn different tricks and get to practice their new skating skills with guidance from an instructor. And this winter break, the program is accepting kids as young as six years old, and it takes place at the popular Skaters Point. Another winter break program cultivates kids' creative side. Art from the Heart shows kids that they can achieve their dreams as long as they put their heart into it. During the winter break, when everyone else is hustling, bustling, shopping, we are going to focus on the true gift, which is a kind heart, and just hopefully slow the pace down a little bit with the kids and hear what's on their heart during the holiday season. Whether it's dancing, singing, cooking, painting, or writing, Art from the Heart encourages diverse expression. One of my favorite things is when I get a student and they say, I can't draw or I can't paint, and it doesn't really take long to convince them that they can. Art from the Heart accepts children ages three and a half to eight, and it takes place this winter break at Mackenzie Park. And if older kids are interested in art, there's a ceramics holiday workshop. There, youth seven to 17 are given instruction and examples of holiday projects they can create. The rest is up to them. And for the first time, Parks and Recreation is offering a holiday Lego workshop, which focuses on teaching kids about engineering using Legos. The kids actually build and design with their engineering skills. And then in the middle of that, we're going to do a big giant Christmas tree and little Lego houses and create a holiday village. The one-day workshop will be for kids ages 5 to 7 at Mackenzie Park. And for kids who crave variety, the Great Escape is the perfect fit. Offered at Monroe Elementary, kids go on field trips to places like Stern's Wharf and make crafts like homemade wrapping paper and pinecone bird feeders. I think all of our programs are popular, but this one's um, especially fun for the children when they can come together and get ready for the holidays. And for more information, visit sbparksandrecreation.com. Well, every Sunday along Cabrillo Boulevard, a 44-year-old tradition takes place. Up next, City TV's photojournalist Jeff Goodwin shares with us the sights and sounds among artists and art lovers in this local tradition. All great cultures throughout history have been measured by their artists and their, and their architecture. Ten years ago, I visited the art show, and um, I've always done art. I've always been creating stuff with ceramics or paints and glass, and I um, thought it was so beautiful and so diverse. I wanted to come down and do this myself one day, and here I am. Somebody from Oregon who came. I'm always doing my own work, and um, it's great to have a place to show. You know, you could have stacks of paintings at your house, but to get them out there where people could look. And um, there's a percentage that buy, and that's what supports us, which is great. But we're also happy just for people to see the work and get it out there. It's, it's enjoyable. I, I like to tell people that there's a certain connective tissue that happens out here. Somebody told me that this reminded them of an art show that they went to in San Rafael, France, which I had been there as well a long time ago. And they said every Sunday they have an art show like this. And Europeans love it. They, they say when they get to Santa Barbara, they feel at home. And then when they come to the art show, they feel at home. And they just sort of light up that it's something that reminds them of the cultural place that they're from. It's important to be out here. It's important for our community to be out here and to know that people can shop locally and produce work locally that's going to be purchased. Like when you go to a museum, looking at work somehow, like looking at a show or going to a performance, it somehow enhances your life or, you know, makes you aware of the creativity that's around. This is local artists. This is for everybody to enjoy. And people can find anything here. I mean, it's something for everybody here. With a great culture, needs to, to have a thriving arts community. And Santa Barbara's arts community has been thriving and is thriving. And for more information on the Arts and Crafts Show, visit sbaacs.com. Well, that does it for this month's episode of Inside Santa Barbara. If you have any questions about the show, give us a call at City TV at 
You can also watch the show online at CityTV18.com. I'm your host, Rachel Senes, and remember to get involved inside Santa Barbara. Shouldn't that go into recycling? 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 Everybody knows the trash gets sorted. We don't need no stinking recycling. Fact is, no trash gets sorted, friend. So if it goes in there, it just ends up at a landfill. There's only one way to settle this. Draw. Barber recycle. <laughs> years ago, early cave dwellers relied on natural fiber shoulder pouches to gather their food. Native Americans used baskets made of rushes or reeds to collect and carry acorns, berries, or fish. In the mid-19th century, gold miners loaded their saddlebags with precious metals and packed it onto their donkeys. Even 1930s American movie icons skip down the yellow brick road with full baskets for the journey. In the 70s, we were all grooving to the latest funkadelic sounds with our out-of-sight bags. History shows us that reusable is a better way to go. So this holiday season, use reusable bags for all your shopping. Where's your bag? Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Hassler, the health officer for Santa Barbara County. I'd like to spend a minute with you to talk about how to avoid getting the H1N1 or swine flu. The swine flu virus is spread in the same way as seasonal flu virus. Either you breathe in the virus when someone sneezes or coughs near you, or you have the virus on your hands and you touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. To reduce the risk of catching the flu, stay away from people who appear sick, wash your hands with soap and water, cough or sneeze into a tissue or your sleeve, keep your hands away from your eyes, nose, and mouth, and get vaccinated for the seasonal and H1N1 flu. For more information, visit sbcfluinfo.org or call 1-888-722-6358.